Hi everyone, welcome to the next lecture in the Unknown Structure Spectroscopy course, and we are finally ready to dive in and tackle carbon-13 NMR in this lecture. So if you have any generalized questions regarding chemical shift, integration, or coupling, which is also known as splitting, I would encourage you to check the prior video in the series. And I also have some other videos on YouTube that goes into a lot more detail on those topics. So what we're going to take a look at here to start off with is a generalized table of chemical shift because that's the first thing you sort of want to zone in on when you're looking at a carbon-13 NMR. So we have the general type of carbon that we would be looking at and then we have the chemical shift which is going to be an approximation but it's a pretty good guidepost as far as where you would expect to find some of these sorts of uh, carbon structures. So to begin, you have your sp3 hybridized hydrocarbons. So this includes your methyls, your methylenes, and your methenes. Now, when you have these, the methyls are going to be the lowest on the ppm. They have the most shielding, and then it's going to decrease as you go along. You're going to get more deshielding and move up in ppm. So anywhere from about 10 to 35 would be the methyls, and then you shift up a little. The methylenes, which is the term for a CH2 group, is going to be 20 to 50 ppms. The uh, methines are going to be 30 to 60, and that's going to be about where those hydrocarbons would land. Now, once you start putting on more of the electron withdrawing groups, uh, such as the halides, the oxygens, the nitrogens, you're going to see a shift even further upwards in terms of ppm. So once some of that deshielding occurs, we see that the bromides and the chlorides usually hang somewhere between 30 to 80 ppm. And then the carbons associated with nitrogen and oxygen go from about 40 to 80. So once you go primarily past the 40 mark and you start heading up towards 80, that's when you're looking at carbons that most likely have some electron withdrawing behavior nearby. There's some deshielding that's starting to occur in your carbons. Now, as we start to approach 100, you're going to be talking more about your triple bonds. So your alkynes and your nitriles, carbons that are associated with those types of functionalities, are going to appear somewhere the lower end 60 all the way up to about 90 ppm. And then when you get your double bonds, your alkenes, those are going to end up around 100 to 150. So they can have a pretty wide range. One of the most important regions is going to be the aromatic region. Now, it's pretty large in scope. It's from 110 to 170 ppm. But part of that is because when you have aromatic carbons, aromatic carbons are also subjected to electron withdrawing and electron donating groups that can be found on the rings. And through resonance, you can greatly affect the donating or withdrawing properties that the individual carbons receive. So any carbon that is in resonance format with an electron donating group is going to be on the lower end, so about 110 to maybe 120 to 125 ppm. Then you have just your regular aromatic carbons, which is probably somewhere like 125 up through about 1, maybe 40, 135, 140. And then when you get to peaks that are 140 and above up towards 170, those aromatic peaks are usually going to be the ones that have resonance in direct contact with uh, an electron withdrawing group, such as a carbonyl that's found on a ring. Now, if you're confused about some of that, I would encourage you to go watch some of the aromatic lectures for aromatic reactions and aromatic rings that we also have on the channel, because that will help explain the electron donating versus withdrawing behavior. And it'll also, if you learn the resonance, allow you to pinpoint the exact carbons on the ring that are going to be either upfield or downfield accordingly. Okay, and then once we move past the aromatics, the only other thing you're going to find in a higher region than aromatic are going to be the carbonyl groups. So once you get to the C double bond O groups, uh, your amides tend to be on the lower end, 165 to 175. Then you have esters, carboxylic acids start approaching 185. And then if you ever see them at 200 or above, those are usually the aldehydes and the ketones, especially those ketones. They can get, you know, 210, 220 all the way up there. So we also have a much larger PPM range 
than we do with the proton NMR, which we'll be looking at last. So proton NMRs go from about 0 to 12, and the carbon-13 NMRs have a range of about 0 to 225, 250 sometimes on their ppm scale. So that is the general region in which we would find most of these peaks. So how would you go about starting to assess a carbon-13 that's laid in front of you? This is the general process that I take. So look for general peak regions, which is what we just discussed. You should take the carbon-13 NMR, and as you're looking at it, make general um, discoveries that you can classify. So do you have aromatics? You should be able to very easily scan the region of 110 to 170 and see if you have peaks there. And if you do, you should mark down that you likely have aromatics. Okay, do you have any carbonyls? That's another region that's very easily identifiable. Now, it's not to say that there aren't other regions that aren't of use, but something like, let's say, the region between 0 to 50, while that is of use, we would expect most organic compounds to have sp3 hybridized hydrocarbons. So you're not going to get a whole lot of information there other than the fact that you know there's hydrocarbons there. But when we talk about aromatics and carbonyls, those are very specific functional groups that tell us more about the compound. All right, now what you can do by looking at the entire spectrum is you can see, do I have electron withdrawing groups near hydrocarbons? Because if I start to see things from like the 50 to 100 region, then I potentially have some electron withdrawing behavior that's deshielding some of the carbons that are associated with that compound. So once I have a general look at the PPM and chemical shift and what that might embody, the next thing you want to do is count the peaks. Now this is useful because it's going to tell you how many unique carbons you have. When you count the peaks, you want to go through and count each individual one. If your solvent peak is there for whatever solvent you ran the NMR in, you want to make sure you ignore that. And you also, when you are counting, want to make sure the peak that is at zero, if you see a peak there, you would ignore that because that is for the tetramethylsilene, which is your internal standard. But any other peaks, if you count the individual number of peaks, then you will have the number of unique carbons. So that doesn't mean it's necessarily the total number of carbons because some carbons can be identical to one another, but it will give you a count on the uniqueness. Now, if you have a formula, sometimes you're given one and sometimes you're not, but if you have a formula that's associated with your mass spec or your degrees of unsaturation, you can look at the number of carbons that are provided there and you can match it to the carbon 13. And if it's a one-to-one -one count, then you know every single carbon is unique. There is no type of symmetry or identicalness between the carbons. But if you see that you come up short, then you must have some level of symmetry or some carbons must match other carbons in terms of their uh, uniqueness, All right? And then number three, this doesn't always apply, but sometimes it's provided, was a DEPT, which is D-E-P-T, NMR provided, specifically a DEPT-135, okay? Now you'll know this because it'll usually label DEPT-135 at the top, and these are the NMRs where you see some peaks are above the PPM line, and then there are some that are dipping below. Uh, and this is used to determine if you have methylene groups. So the way that the DEPT-135 works is if you have any CH2 groups, the peaks will appear below the PPM line. And if you see any that are upright, those are going to either be methyl groups or the methane groups, which are the CH groups. And quaternary carbons, or carbons that don't have any hydrogens attached to them, will not appear in the depth 135. So that's also useful because you can compare that to your regular C13, and you can see if any of the peaks just all of a sudden vanish or disappear, you know that those peaks would likely be associated with carbons that have no hydrogens attached to them. All right, so this can be a very useful piece of information. So let's take a look at this structure right here. We have a common amino acid, tyrosine, and we want to examine the carbon-13 that is associated with it. So when it says C13 decoupled, I believe we talked about this in the previous lecture briefly. 
decoupled means that the splitting or the coupling constant has been sort of turned off in the NMR. So we're just going to see individual singlet peaks. We're not expecting any triplets or doublets or multiplets or things of that nature. That's usually reserved for proton NMR. So if we come down and we take a look at the C13 NMR, this is just the regular one here, we can look at what we've got. So imagining for a moment that we don't know the structure of tyrosine, I would come and I would look at this structure here, this spectra. So the spectrum, I'm going to ignore the zero because that's the internal standard. So I come along, I see that there's some regular sp3 hybridized carbons. So these are sp3 ch type of groups. Now they might be ch3, ch2, or ch. Um, but I do know that there's probably some sort of withdrawing activity nearby. So, uh, especially from this one that's 60 here. And I'm going to start counting my peaks. So I have 1, 2. Then I come up here, 120 to about 135. So this would be aromatic right here, without a doubt. And then I keep coming up here, all right? And as I look, I see that there are some other peaks this right here around 165 this could be carbonyl or it could be aromatic so i'm not sure but i know it's going to be one of those and then if i get as high as the 185 to 190 region which is this last one here then I, at that point i'm definitely looking at some sort of a carbonyl group okay and probably not an amide or an ester it would be a carboxylic acid uh most likely a carboxylic acid or an aldehyde a ketone wouldn't show up that low Okay, so if I continue counting here, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So let's look at the carbons that we have here. I have one carbon associated with the carbonyl, two, which is where the NH2, the amine for the amino acid, comes off of, three, right here, and then I get to the ring. I've got four, I have five, and I'm marking these down here, five and six, seven and eight, and then nine. So I counted seven peaks, right? However, I see that there's nine in the structure. So whether the structure was given, that doesn't make as much sense if we were solving for unknowns. But if you had the formula here, you would see that it would say C9 associated with the formula. And you would realize there has to be some level of symmetry for some of these groups. Now, which carbons are the ones that have the identical peak signal there? It would be this carbon with this carbon, and it would be this carbon with this carbon. Because if we look at the ring from a sym symmetrical standpoint, Right? We've got this OH group, and then we slice it up the top here. Here's this other group. So I can draw a mirror image within the plane here, where I've got the same on the left as I do on the right of that ring. And so those appear as these identical peaks that we see over here. Right? So again, just from looking at this, I was able to tell that I've got some sort of CH groups, I've got aromatic activity, and I have a carbonyl group. So that's useful information that I gathered by just looking at that. I also determined that I have seven unique carbons based on what I have here. Okay. Now, if I were to go through and start assigning these, I would want to consider what I have here. So the carbonyl, which is a carboxylic acid, we know that that's going to be number seven here, right? That would be that peak right there. And then if we take a look at six, six is going to have to do with the aromatics here, all right? Same with five, four, and three. And then, so we know all of those are aromatic. And then when I have one and two, I've got a carbon that's a CH2 right here. And then I've got a carbon that is directly next to the carbonyl and the NH2. Now, if you think about that for a second, the one that is directly attached to the NH2 and the carbonyl group has a lot of electron withdrawing going on. And so I would expect this carbon right here to be the one that shows up at the 60 mark.
because as the deshielding occurs from electron withdrawing groups, I'm going to end up seeing a push downfield. And that means that I will find a higher ppm. Now, what might be of interest here is if we take a look at the depth 135, we can see some of these peaks that still hang out here, and some of them have vanished, and one of them has inverted. So again, we know that the one around 60, which we just discussed, would be this CH group right here. So that makes sense that it is still in the same position. It is upright because in a depth, the CH and the CH3 groups are going to appear upright, and the CH2s are going to be inverted on the bottom. So we also mentioned we had this CH2 here. That was the other hydrocarbon. And sure enough, this peak at 40, which was this one right up here, has inverted itself. And that's because it belonged to that methylene group. Now, what's interesting here is if you come and you look, these two larger aromatic peaks stay present. And the one that we labeled 4 and 6 here, they drop off. We don't see them anymore. And the question is, which ones are associated with which? Well, 5 and 3 have to be the ones that are not quaternary. So 4 and 6 are quaternary carbons because the quaternaries vanish, meaning they have no hydrogens. So on the aromatic ring, which sets contain hydrogens? Well, it would be the ones that have symmetry. These guys have the hydrogens, right? Because every position on the aromatic ring can contain one group. These are the hydrogens. And then we also have the OH group. So this carbon right here does not contain any H's. And this carbon right here does not contain any. So those two are the ones that disappeared, right? And keep in mind, there is also the carbonyl group associated with the carboxylic acid. That disappeared as well. Because again, this carbon right here does not have any hydrogens directly attached to it. So as a quaternary carbon, right, it's just a carbon with no hydrogens, it does not show up in the depth. So this is what we are left with here. Now, from a resonance standpoint, the hydroxyl group is the one that would donate electrons down into the system, and then it would push the electrons onto this carbon that is ortho, to the carbon with the hydroxyl group. So this carbon and this carbon would be receiving the donating benefits, which means we would expect it to be better shielded, and therefore it would be the one that we find further upfield around 120, instead of the one at 135, which is not getting the donation and is getting some of the withdrawing effects on the opposite end. Okay, now they're a little more distant, but that is how that setup would be. So that is how you would analyze a carbon-13 NMR. Now keep in mind, we are piecing this together lecture by lecture. So what you really want to do, and we'll tie this together with a practice session at the end, is you want to use everything we've been going over, your mass spec, your IR, your degrees of unsaturation, your carbon-13, and then finally what the next lecture will be, the proton NMR. And when you put them all together, you gather enough information to make a pretty good case for yourself. All right? So that concludes the Carbon 13 lecture. Remember, you can go over to chemcomplete.com if you want to support the free course that we're offering here. You can pick up our guide, which is very comprehensive. It has additional practice problems you're not going to get here on the channel, and it's a great way to support us. It is only $15 for the guide. Um, you can also check out some of the other services we offer over there, including one-on-one -on -one tutoring online and we also have a free resource section for some videos that we've been putting out so i encourage you to go to chemcomplete.com and check us out there other than that if you found the video helpful make sure that you leave a like and if you subscribe you will be up to date with every time that we release new content on the channel so other than that everybody have a great rest of your day and we will see you for the next lecture